The contents of this webinar have been inspired by studies conducted by the PSFK research team. Their reports are part of a collection of over 400 reports that share innovation strategies and brand CX in retail. And this library is updated weekly and can be found in the PSFK IQ Business Intelligence platform. Visit psfk.com to sign up for a free trial today. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another PSFK webinar where we help our community understand opportunities, consider the challenges, uh, and find new ways to kind of activate uh, innovation in retail along the customer journey. Today, we're going to take a look at Gen Z, uh, and we're going to look at the kind of new ways that that generation is moving. In particular, how they are developing a, into a kind of creator class and how brands, consumer goods companies, solution providers, and retailers need to respond, interact, transact uh, with that audience. So we have today a group of experts who are going to help us uh, unpack that. Say hello to the experts. That's great, and we'll come to them. But before we talk to the experts, we're also going to talk to the, our own, very own expert, Lauren Lyons, who is Senior Strategist here at PSFK. Hi, Lauren. Welcome. Hey, Piers. Happy to be here. Welcome, everybody. It's great, great to have you here. So you've conducted a bunch of uh, trends, innovation, research, uh, looking at this group and created a report, this report that we can see on the screen right now. What's the overall kind of premise to the to the report? Yeah, so, you know, it's the first truly digital native generation. Gen Zers, you know, they're really used to moving seamlessly between that online and offline world and also freely expressing themselves um, across platforms and in real life interactions. And this has really shaped them as a generation that's able to um, really adapt to new tech and simultaneously exist as both that creator and consumer. So that was kind of our main um, theme of this report. And so today's presentation, we're gonna touch on you know, um, kind of a framework. We're going to discuss consumer insights, um, innovative case studies from across the marketplace, and then also just strategies that um, retailers and brands can use to engage, empower, and collaborate with this generation of consumer creators. So um, it's interesting because I think about three years ago, PSFK created a Gen Z report. And in that report, we saw behavior where consumers, young consumers wanted to be involved in the brand narrative, uh, even involved in kind of the product development as well. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how they have evolved over those few years. Um, what's your research found? What are the kind of key findings? Yeah, so what's interesting is, um, you know, when we consider these creator consumers, right, we're seeing that new experiences are being built that not only cater to Gen Z, but are actually being built by Gen Z in their own vision. And at the same time, you know, this continued evolution of technology and the marketplace have created new expectations and opportunities around all these ideas that are really important to Gen Z, such as authenticity, transparency, empowerment, and then even customization and personalization. So these are the ways that we're kind of seeing that shift and how we're going to be talking about it in the report. Great. Just pick up some of the kind of key insights. Okay. So... One big thing to kick us off here is really this idea of shared community and how important that is to Gen Z. We have this great stat from our own uh, survey that we conducted with 57% of Gen Z consumers reporting that they're interested in actually participating in online communities um, around these shared passions. And these consumers really see brands as the ones facilitating those connections and building those spaces for them. Um, with 71% of consumers actually looking for brands to put that community first for them. So really interesting there when we're discussing uh, the community aspect here. Yeah, and, very interesting. 
Yeah. So like movie, like kind of just building on that, you know, for brands and retailers from their point of view, these communities really represent an opportunity to collaborate with the consumer they're selling to. Um, interesting stat here was how 49% are actually more interested in making purchases um, from the brands that offer resources, mentoring and support for these emerging creators and entrepreneurs. So just thinking about how, you know, how brands and retailers can get more involved in that process. So when they want to get involved in the community, they actually also want to get involved in kind of the entrepreneurial side of the business or the creative side of community. Exactly, exactly. And then building on that too, you know, it's like further community, this community aspect can really translate into activating that everyday consumer as your brand ambassador and even advocate. And a great stat here we found was 47% of Gen Z would actually act as a brand ambassador in exchange for, you know, increased status, perks and income. And then just for this last stat here, you know, 50% are actually aspiring to become an entrepreneur or a creator, right? And what's interesting here is we're really seeing that role of the influencer or a creator from macro to micro really evolve, especially for this generation. And it's shifting from working on behalf of a brand or retailer to instead, you know, harnessing that community that they themselves have created and their followers, and then launching, you know, their own business, whether it's, you know, content creation, their own brand, an expert skill or service that they can provide. And there's a ton of platforms actually popping up right now to support that and make that more accessible for them. So a really interesting space to consider as well. Yeah, that's an incredible stat. I can't wait to kind of ask some of the experts we have about their reaction to it. So let's push on. And um, so that was a great kind of setup in terms of this group and the, the original research that you did, the polling that you did with young American <laughs> Gen Z adults. Um, in terms of the, the findings in the reports, what uh, examples do you have in terms of best in class engagements with Gen Z? Yeah, so to kind of like kick us off here. Um, first up, we have this great brand called Conundrum. They are a fashion brand that actually lets consumers kind of build their own garments. And what makes Conundrum's offering unique is it actually has a proprietary custom garment system, which allows customers to start with, you know, one of four core jacket styles and then customize their purchase from a range of um, different parts, including the sleeves, the vents, the hoods, and more. So these consumer created jackets can also be upgraded and reconfigured later to fit changing shopper styles and functionalities. And so the real idea here is inviting consumers into that customization process um, and then is what stands out and then speaks to kind of our first strategy as well. That's going to tee up here um, as we move into this. That's great. So what is the kind of strategy that you see or you've defined? Yeah. So first one we have up is called program programmable customization. And so this ability to customize, manipulate, um, and ultimately create a unique to me item is a sought after, you know, offering among Gen Z's creative class. And so to help consumers really take ownership of that final design, we're seeing how brands are really providing them with, you know, design guidance, creative assets, AR filters, automated printing solutions, all these different digital tools to really allow for their personal preference to come through and kind of have more control over that end-to-end -end DIY process. That's great. I heard that. And it's not always the platforms they control as well. They create. So sometimes offering different platforms to, to those shoppers and their consumers. Exactly. Um, let's, uh, great. That's a super interesting example. Uh, take us through this example. All right, so pushing ahead here. Next thing we have up, or next example we have up, it comes from Pretty Little Thing, which is a fast fashion e-tailer um, based in the UK. And they've actually um, have been venturing into the secondhand trading market and have launched an online marketplace that allows users to sell um, their used items from both Pretty Little Thing and everywhere else. And so this resale service is gonna roll out in the UK in May, and then it has plans to become an international service as well later in the year. 
And customers that participate are actually going to receive that credit towards their next Pretty Little Things order. Um, you know, as a lot of as a fast fashion brand involving and rewarding your customers for their participation and like this type of impactful green friendly practice is definitely smart for this generation where they really care about um, things around sustainability, but may not have the wallet to per participate and practice those beliefs every time. And so, you know, consumers across every socioeconomic level are going to be able to participate in the resale economy here and actually, you know, generate value for themselves by able to um, gain a reward there as well. Yeah, very interesting example of Gen Z interaction and engagement. Uh, what's the kind of bigger strategy here? Yeah, and so here we're really playing this back to this idea of what we're calling circular marketplaces. And this is really the evolution of, you know, buyback and resale programs where brands are creating entire resale marketplaces that go beyond their solo brand. You know, understanding that savvy consumers are investing in items and brands that promise the greatest return on value are exploring new ways to support their customers, sellers in their own right. And so looking beyond, um, you know, the brand only take that program, right? And this is a great, the Pretty Little Things Regain program is a great example of that. Um, I know that uh, Urban Outfitters is trying this as well with their Newly program. Um, but really the cool part here is that they're tying these resale rewards back to their own brands. Um, and as multi-brand platforms, they're really succeeding at capturing greater consumer interest there while also driving repeat sales back to their business. Yeah, really playing into this, uh, the Gen Z's uh, desire for sustainability and transparency as well. That's Thank great. You. Yeah, so just pushing forward for us, a lot of content to get through. So this next example we have up is called Try Your Best, and it's actually a uh, digital asset reward-based community, um, and it's platform for brands to use. And so this is coming from the founder of Outdoor Voices, Ty Haney, and it was creating uh, as a new Web3 community platform. So Try Your Best enables brands to collect input from consumers in exchange for rewards like NFTs, digital collectibles, um, as well as what they're calling brand coins that can be used for, you know, bragging rights or towards future purchases made on this Try Your Best platform. Uh, so far, 10 brands have signed up for the Try Your Best pilot program. And this platform is hoping to, you know, reach millennials, the Gen Z type audience, and people who really buy a brand because they love it and post about it on Instagram and elsewhere um, because they believe in it, right? And so the platform offers a way for consumers to um, really connect with others who share similar interests and also have a direct relationship with brands to provide that real-time feedback around everything from you know, new product ideas to where they think that that brand should be heading. So a really interesting idea here um, that's kind of gonna feed into our next uh, strategy as well. And so this is what we're calling fan focus groups. And you know, a hyper loyal, engaged fan base affords brands and retailers a dedicated and passionate resource um, for feedback on everything from existing products they have, upcoming launches, any charitable efforts or corporate initiatives or community initiatives that they want to make, create. And retailers and brands are really transforming, um, you know, these passive communities into assets for themselves. They're inviting their top followers to participate in discussions, everything from A-B testing and feedback sessions. And, you know, these efforts really strengthen the consumer relationship, but also are able to unearth new needs and opportunities for the business to take action on. It's a really impactful, um, I think, strategy here for brands and retailers to know. Very interesting. Very interesting to see how we brands and retailers collaborating with, with their consumers and uh, really kind of creating extra and added value here. Let's push on. So what other examples do you have when it comes to engaging Gen Z? Yeah, so next up we have Doom Day X, and this is also Web3 related. This is a Web3 studio, and it's giving fans a say in the creative and marketing decisions of their favorite artists' music videos. So pretty cool. Um, it's similar to crowdfunding. Musicians design and sell an NFT. Fans who buy in are actually able to help shape the music video's vision. So it's granting them that NFT purchase is granting them, you know, a production or a production credit at the end of the music video, actually. So 
fans are able to sell the NFT on the secondhand marketplace after the music video airs or hold on to that as their own personal collectible um, to show that they participated in this uh, collaborative effort. And so I think the cool thing here and how we kind of are backing into this idea is um, what we're calling customer stakeholders. And with this strategy, we're really looking at the rise of DAOs or member-owned communities and the power dynamic between the consumer and their favorite brand or retailer, and how that's really becoming a more equitable experience. Um, and the, the top takeaway here is really rather than joining you know, that passive membership program or loyalty program, consumers are actually able to show their commitment to a, band, to a brand, um, a creator, an initiative by buying into that business, uh, supporting a piece of work, supporting an artist they believe in. And in return, these super fans are being awarded benefits within the company um, from everything from profit sharing to voting rights and are really giving an active voice in determining how the community a business and initiative grows and expands. Yeah, I guess through tokenization um, and blockchain technology, we can track consumers, fans, participation, and then it's much easier to reward that participant, well, encourage and reward that participation, whether it's in a DAO, whether it's in a forum or beyond. Very interesting. So tell us about Offscript. Yeah, so Offscript, it's a Stockholm-based startup, and it's actually helping consumers curate products and brands to sell from their own shop for free. So Offscript, it's a multi-brand e-commerce platform, and it allows consumers to create their own shop, choose from, you know, over 150, I think it is, brands that they feature, and then connect and share their favorite products with their friends, social media followers, through a unique storefront link that Offscript generates for them. And this can be anyone with a following of, you know, 100 friends to 10,000 to 100,000. So they don't discriminate against how big or small your following is. Anyone can come to Offscript and sign up to become a seller here. And so for each sale made, Offscript receives 20, 25% commission um, from the featured brand with two thirds of that um, actually going directly to the Offscript seller. So there's a way here for consumers to you know, back their favorite brands, make recommendations to their followers that have a more authentic feel because it's coming from them, um, but also be rewarded for, you know, their curation, their effort to put this brand out there and for their brand love as well. And so for this, we're looking at a strategy what we're calling ambassador storefronts. And, you know, in place of paid influencers, and affiliate partnerships. Everyday consumers have come to represent authenticity um, as Gen Z shoppers seek out what are being referred to as genuine influencers. And so, you know, micro influencers and true brand fans for inspirations, um, they're looking to them for everything from inspiration to education and recommendations, right? So to activate their own consumer base, brands and retailers are developing these ambassador programs where any consumer can participate, any consumer can apply, um, no matter their social following. And then they're actually given the freedom to create on their own, right? Curate, curate their own selections. So yeah. beyond brand loyalty, right? So beyond brand loyalty, companies are incentivizing consumers to participate. They're offering commission for their sales. Um, and they're also offering a chance to access exclusive opportunities such as co-creation input, uh, the chance to participate in live events on behalf of the brand um, and more. So an interesting way here to kind of think about how it is that we are seeing brands activate that Gen Z consumer in a way that's beneficial for both brand and consumer. Yeah, I like the, um, the lack of friction to get involved. <laughs> so democracy. I mean, obviously, these consumers, these ambassadors actually have to grab and do stuff, yes. whether it's yeah. sharing or creating, but uh, the, barriers, the barriers to stop them from doing that are greatly reduced. Exactly. The next example we have up is from the retailer Nordstrom, who is enlisting social media influencers into their ambassador program. 
And so this program is giving, you know, emerging content creators opportunity to work with uh, Nordstrom's brand creative social teams. They're going to be producing original content to share across um, Nordstrom and Nordstrom Rack social channels. So they're going to be participating in virtual meetings with the design, marketing, tech, merchandising leaders. And these participants are participants are actually going to be able to gain this mentor mentorship experience in retail, fashion, content creation, and digital styling. So this is designed really to help them, um, you know, move beyond in their expertise to learn the ins and outs of how, you know, a business operates, how they can be doing this on their own as well, and really giving them more of a tool set as they go forth with creating their own brands, perhaps. And this is how we kind of came al along to this idea of, you know, brand is platform. So while barriers to starting an online business or brand are really lower than ever, many young creative entrepreneurs are still finding that process of getting off the ground, scaling their offering to be a challenge. Um, so for established brands, there's definitely an opportunity to develop programs that supply the education, the resources needed to navigate these ins and outs of starting a business and or provide that platform to help creators grow their own following. So by establishing these initiatives, companies are raising cultural capital and relevance with Gen Z while building stronger relationships with emerging talent. Yeah, I guess. Um... The legacy brands, legacy retailers, they have a footprint which can be leveraged <laughs> to kind of introduce uh, these creators to, um, to consumers and shoppers, to experts, internal experts and resources and other partners. I think that Nordstrom example seems very progressive of them. Um, and, it, and the whole, this whole sequence reminds me of that stat we had earlier about how 50% of Gen Z, Gen Zers uh, consider themselves entrepreneurial as, as creators. Exactly. And I think this is great as a way to kind of connect the dots for them as well. They might be, you know, a content creator, an expert in that, but they might not know, you know, how to leverage that, how to get that out to their um, desired audience and whatnot. So I love the idea of helping Gen Z, you know, achieve their goals? How can brands play that role? Great. What other examples do you have here? Yeah. So next up, we have Valde Beauty and how they're actually uh, connecting a lifetime membership to an NFT collective. So when customers purchased one of the beauty brands limited edition lipstick cases, it came with a full range of the brand's lipstick shades, a matching NFT artwork, and a lifetime membership to the Valde uh, NFT collective. And so NFT holders will enjoy access to the brand's um, Discord channels, as well as invites to exclusive talks with the brand's founder, um, celebrity makeup artists, musical artists. Members were also gonna receive special digital wearable to show off in the future metaverse social events. And so with this example, we wanted to back this into what we're calling um, owner membership. And for this strategy, we're really looking at how refreshing that classic membership program, um, innovative brands and retailers are creating this ongoing value and lifelong consumer relationship by attaching these exclusive access or privileges to product ownership and community participation. So by attaching, you know, tiers of offerings to sp specific products, and membership levels, businesses are able to create these new models where initial buy-in translates to ongoing value experiences and services and kind of more of just an active role um, membership program here. As you go through this, I mean, I, I must, you must have found the researching all these examples that you came across so intriguing. I don't know how you found time to even write the report because you probably rabbit hole down all these amazing companies and projects. The curation pro process definitely took a lot of time to figure out final picks here, but all really yeah. interesting. And so kind of just to, you know, on that note, to wrap us out here, we have our last uh, example and then strategy. And so here we wanted to highlight IKEA, who's really building on their promise to become a fully circular company by 2030. And so the Swedish uh, furniture brand is teaching its customers how to upcycle the company's products in creative ways. And so by following the brand's repurposeful instructions, which is a manual, 
that details beginner, intermediate, and advanced DIY products. IKEA customers are now able to give a second life, right, to products that otherwise would have ended up by the curb, most likely. And so these different projects include everything from um, the simple turning your candle holder into a planter, um, a little more intense building a hanging garden with the brand's signature bags, and then also transforming a cabinet into a beehive for the very adventurous. And so here, really, the idea that we wanted to play up was layering in um, learnings and lessons for a consumer that's always looking to grow, It's very curious, um, and who wants to learn, right? So we're calling this strategy Elevated Product Experience. And brands are tapping into Gen Z's penchant for lifelong learning by layering educational services into their products and offerings, you know, from creating lessons for skills development to providing suggestions on how to repurpose and repair products, which is important right now as well for a lot of these consumers. You know, brands are maximizing that ownership experience and also the post-purchase value and in doing so really strengthening that customer loyalship um, and relationship as well. Well, there's a lot to, uh, you've gone through. So I see in this slide uh, a summary of the kind of strategies you've talked about. Maybe you can just quickly go take us through the eight themes. Yeah, so, you know, eight themes here. Programmable customization is really giving customers and Gen Z customers, especially the tools to really design their own products, their own experiences, circular marketplaces. You know, sustainability is really important to these consumers letting them participate in that in a way that's accessible um, while also you know participating in resale but we're re being rewarded for it um, super important to them and focus groups this is where community comes into play we're seeing how um, you know leading fans leading followers can really provide brands and retailers with um, interesting insights that they may otherwise not have been able to unearth based on their feedback and testing uh, customer stakeholders, we're seeing customers actually take ownership in the brands and retailers, the products that they love, um, and being able to decide, you know, what, how they're represented, um, what their end result is, and how they function out in the real world, right? Um, ambassador storefronts, here we're seeing consumers um, kind of translate from uh, just an influencer participant to actually becoming the sales and brand ambassador and being rewarded for their efforts. Uh, brand is pl platform builds on this where we're seeing, you know, going from someone who may have been an influencer and represented another brand to actually being able to use a brand's platform to create their own brand um, and get their message out there on their own. Then we go into owner membership. And here we're seeing, you know, how different membership programs can become more active and have participants in them um, really have a say in how that membership program uh, supports them. And then finally, just rolling this out, we have ele elevated product experience, and this is where you're tying in, you know, lifelong learning, additional services, um, and then extra perks too, as well into that post product, post purchase experience. Okay, so that's a great foundation that Lauren's just taken us through. Let's um, now talk to some experts in the field of who are actively engaging Gen Z. Um, let's take a look at who we have. Joining us for the Gen Z webinar is Stanley Lumax. Stanley is the Chief Marketing Officer of NRG Esports, a Los Angeles-based professional gaming and entertainment company. Also with us is Michael Ogbozek, who leads brand, retail, and product partnerships at Shutterfly, where he is helping accelerate the company's transformation in the on-demand and custom design space. Warren Chesley is the retail head of industry at SXM Media, where she leads strategy and development. Anthony Onesto is chief people officer at Suzy, and a leading Gen Z expert and published author on culture, human resources, and talent. And finally, we have Amanda Howe, who is an expert partner in Bain and Company's consumer products and customer strategy and marketing practices. Hello to the experts. So let's now talk to Lauren Chesley. She's head of industry for the retail vertical at SXM Media. Hey, Lauren, great to have you here. Hi, Pierre. It's nice to be with you today. That's great. So, you know, you work for a company that's always engaging 
uh, different generations and particularly Gen Z must be um, a particularly important target for you. I mean, what do you think the biggest opportunities are where, for businesses as they get to engage um, this generation? Yeah, I mean, I think a big part of it is understanding their power and honoring it and not looking at it just as buying power. Obviously, with them being a bit younger, they may not have the dollars that match a lot of the, ma the marketing allocations for why you might go after a target. But I think it goes back to knowing their role in culture, right? So um, as you talk about trends, youth culture has always been the forefront of trends. So honoring and acknowledging that and recognizing, particularly in this world where so many things are fast forwarding at a rapid speed, that they really are the drivers, um, you know, pushing things forward. And I would say within that too, understanding that it's a personal experience versus a cohort experience with them. So oftentimes when we've looked at generations, I know buzzword a couple of years ago is millennial generation. And it's like, you can't look at a multi-million group uh, of people and say they're all alike, right? But I think particularly with Gen Z, a big part of who they are and how they show up is by way of their individual identity. So acknowledging them from a personalized experience versus a cohort experience is key. Um, and within that, learning what's important to them and showing up within that. So from my observations, I've seen that community identity and sustainability are three things that tend to pop for Gen Z. But again, within that, it's, it's getting curious and honoring that their individualized experiences are meaningful and understanding um, from their voices what is important to them and aligning to it uh, alongside of aligning to your brand values. That's super interesting. Um I mean, what have you learned in terms of best practices when it comes to engaging this kind of community, uh, whether on an individual level or as a group? Yeah, I think bringing them in at the briefing stage, right? So if you're looking to align to something that you wanna make sure is meaningful to them, it's bringing, bringing them to the table, right? We talk about this a lot, particularly in the last two years about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I think the same thing could be said about Gen Z, particularly because so many of the Gen Z cohort are aligning to a multicultural group. Um, so bring them into the process and allow it to be iterative and fluid. So as you're saying, hey, how are we most meaningful to you? Or these are my brand goals and values and the things that I'm trying to align to, let them lead um, and allow them to be a seat at the table and co-create with them for sure. That's great. I mean, I think co-creation and collaboration seems to be one of the big themes and big opportunities. Uh, is there anything else you can add around how to engage them like this? Yeah, I think co-creating, it's, um, it's acknowledging that you need to listen, right? Um, so if you're not part of the generation, you don't know the generation. So I think honoring that and having conversations, again, like seat at the table means that they're actively engaged and they're in discussion with you. So letting them lead, listening, um, collaborating, co-creating and iterating, I would say like with the listen, it's doing focus groups, having those intimate conversations with collaboration. I think a big part of that is um, so many creators are doing their own things and they're quite successful with it, very young in their lives. And so it's, it's acknowledging that and saying, hey, how can, I, how can I partner with you? How can I collaborate? How can I amplify what you're already up to? And then from a co-creation perspective, that then is the joint endeavor to say, okay, I'm, I'm wanting to be generative with you. How, how might we create something that doesn't exist together? Um, and oftentimes within that, be in their community, right? So they're innately in particular spaces that I think are newer for all of us, right? So be it the metaverse um, or even the sustainability conversations, arguably too, um, understanding what's important having that conversation and co-creating together is huge. And then um, making sure that you iterate, it's not gonna be perfect out the gates. And I think because so many things are moving very quickly, um, it's a go live and learn mentality. You might put something out there, you learn something from it, but then also kind of honor that, okay, well, what's next? Or how do we, how do we make that a little bit nuanced based on what we learned? I love that particularly in the audio space, right? So um, podcasting is an example these creators are out there and they are driving these conversations and they really are the consumer themselves and they're a filter and a reflection of gen z so oftentimes as we're looking at those partnerships it's really about how do how do we come to where you are how do we give you a stage and amplify your voice and podcasting happens to be one of those um you know core audio 
experiences that people are leaning into more and it's it's successful because it's conversational and people are um, interested in hearing what these audiences or what these um, curators uh, have to say. So I think that piece of um, listening, leaning in and showing up where they're at is definitely key. So building off that point, I want to turn to Anthony Onesto. Anthony is Chief People Officer at the End-to-End -End Consumer Insights Platform, Suzy. He's also the author of a new book, The New Employee Contract, who is helping employers understand how to find, keep, and elevate Gen Z talent. Welcome, Anthony. Good to be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Piers. Well, thanks for being part of this. Um, you know, you've just written this book about uh, employing this generation of staff. Um, and what key attributes were you thinking about when you were writing? What were you responding to? And why did you need to write that book? Yeah, I appreciate it. So, I, you know, I have three kids at home. All of them are considered Gen Z. So, you know, I think years ago, what happened was the millennial workforce came into companies and we were all kind of surprised that this workforce, this generation needed things new. And now, of course, it's kind of silly to think about that, but it was a really surprise for us. And so it was only after the fact that we started thinking about millennials and, and really both from a consumer perspective, but even from an employment perspective, I wanted to get ahead of this as this generation was coming in or is about to come into the workforce. I wanted to get ahead of it. Um, and so looking at their behaviors, I said, there's something fundamentally different about this generation, uh, like most generations before them, but this one a little bit more, more different and, and, and started doing the research into this and really realizing that, you know, this, this is a group that was born on the iPhone, right? So you think about the launch of the iPhone, they have had a telephone uh, with access to unlimited information, access to, uh, uh, you know, really quick things, being able to order something and literally have it almost uh, within an hour is, is how this generation was born. And then you add the components of gaming, huge, huge element. So the idea is that their attention span, by the way, eight seconds, eight seconds, and then you lose Gen Z, right? So if you think about from an employment perspective, go onto someone's website, put in an application, it takes more than eight seconds to do that, right? You've already lost them, right? So, so gaming is a big deal for these folks, born on gamers. And a lot, what we've seen, particularly with the parenting of, of Gen Z is kind of sitting just, you know, at the tail end of boomers um, and, and really in the, in the center of Gen X and then a bit of, of the millennials are the parents for these folks. And you think about the economic status that these folks have been involved in since they've been born, right? They really haven't seen too much stable prosperity in, in macroeconomics, particularly in the United States. You think, you know, the recession and uh, the, the market crash and then COVID and all these other things, right? So all of these fascinating elements that are, are molding this generation, we needed to figure out, okay, how do we then apply that to the employment piece, right? How do we literally recruit, engage these folks and train them for the future? That's, it's great that you kind of focus on some of those attributes. As we think about not only as employees, but as consumers and shoppers, how do we kind of take some of those things? How do we, you know, where do you see the biggest opportunities are for businesses to interact, transact, with the, with this group, well, I think you take those same elements, right, on the on the on the talent side, and really apply them on the consumer side. I don't I don't see there's there's much of a difference there, right? So first, if you think about the attention span, right, the idea of, of being able to get the attention, TikTok, obviously a huge component of the uh, the Gen Z entertainment, right? They are constantly they're on mobile phones. So they know about this idea of flexibility, right? They want to be mobile. They want to be able to look at things, but they're constantly uh, on their phone. And TikTok is a great example of this, right? Quick videos, quick content, they're engaged in these things. And so when I think from a consumer perspective, how are you getting your message out to folks that have an eight second attention span, right? They don't, they're not watching TV. They're fast forwarding through commercials. And again, some of this is very, very similar to the millennial generation, but this generation, even more so born on that digital aspect. So I think digital, and, and I know we've been talking about this, COVID accelerating digital, digital is key. It's no longer an option or a good to have or an innovation policy. It is a must have, 
with this generation from that perspective. I also think gamification, right? The idea that these folks are in gaming, that's an incredible opportunity. And we're starting to see that already. A lot of artists are launching on these gaming platforms um, where, where these, these, this generation is sitting and, it, and it's gender agnostic, right? It doesn't matter what your gender is. People are gaming now, I would say, majority are identified as male, but it is really gender agnostic from a gaming perspective. So thinking about, you know, if, if I was a musician, I'd be launching on these platforms. I would hold digital concerts. I would be uh, creating TikTok dances. You know, you think about these platforms, that's where things need, to, you know, songs are being released on these platforms now. So it really becomes an incredible opportunity. So of course, digital now is, a, is, is table stakes. It's no longer the innovation and making sure that you're providing your messaging and your branding quickly. Eight seconds, that's all you have at this generation. Okay, so let's build on that. We also have today uh, Amanda Howe. She is an expert partner at Bain & Co. Um, and she has an expertise in innovation and evidence-based design. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you for having me. Okay, so if we think about inclusion um, and we think about how businesses should approach um, how they interact and transact with, gen with, the, with this generation, this Gen Z, uh, I mean, maybe you can help me think about some of the challenges that they have and some of the opportunities that uh, they might have in, in here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's a couple of points. First of all, at, at, at Bain & Co, we, we advocate for understanding consumers through mindsets, which we find to be more helpful and certainly sits across the generation divide um, in a more in an easier way to frame and, and to understand. But one thing's for sure, what we can't argue with is Gen Z are digital natives. Today's teens have grown up with the ability to research anything. And this we have to be mindful of all the time. They expect integrity and transparency. They can scrutinize and they most certainly will. For example, there are influences in this space like TikTok, um, Megan McSherry, she's um, at Activism. She has gained millions of likes for her videos that call out fashion green washing. So the challenge, what this poses to business is that they need to be able to back up any claims. Um, for those of you that have uh, watched Mad Men, you'll remember the pilot episode when they were faced with the challenge of advertising cigarettes now that the public knows that they're really bad for health. They land on the slogan, it's toasted. It's a nice sounding, very vague claim that means absolutely nothing. This practice will not fly with today's teens. You have to be concrete about your claims. Born in the UK is not the same as manufactured in the UK and consumers know it saying less plastic without the comparison to the original product or competitors is useless and citations of proof are absolutely essential. I think you touch upon one of the big themes um, which is around um, the supply chain and how products are manufactured has an impact, as big an impact on brand as many other kind of factors altogether because of this ability for these teenagers and young people to research and, and share information. And I think that's possibly taking larger brands, legacy brands and retailers by surprise. That, that, look, that, you're absolutely right. And the, there's no doubt, certainly within our sustainable sustainability practice here at Bain, we're talking to our clients about obviously scrutinizing their own supply chain, but also realizing that you, you can't necessarily be entirely clean the whole way along the chain. You've got to do everything that you can, but actually to be able to focus on your peak. So if you take um, Tony's Chocoloni, for example, they have focused so brilliantly around ending the slave trade around, around cocoa and around chocolate production. But at the same time, they're still 
manufacturing a product that is filled with sugar and is to the detriment of the consumers who live on this planet. So the entire con consumer journey is not perfect, but they are fixing and focusing brilliantly and with utter commitment. And I think that is absolutely key to their success. So in, in that scenario, there's a, some, there's some transparency about and some focus, like this is what we're going to deal with. Uh, I'm sure they can respond to other questions about so maybe their dietary products in a, in a they, they still have to talk about that stuff surely, but maybe they don't use it as part of their marketing messages or something. I th look, the, I think that the point is that they've prioritized end-to-end -end consumer journey, but everything is on the horizon, but you can't get there all in one leap. That was really helpful. Uh, maybe we'll turn to Lauren Lyons of the PSFK team, who we saw present earlier. Um, Lauren, I wonder if we could just talk about community. I mean, shared community is a kind of common theme that's kind of run across your Gen Z research. But what do brands and retailers need to think about when they're engaging consumers who are already in a community, they're already in a formal community? Um, how do they engage them or do they have to create their own community? Yeah, and so, you know, community is really important to this group. We had that great stat about how, you know, 57%, I think it is, right, that are interested in participating in these online communities. And for a brand or retailer, whether they're looking to build something like a fan focus group or inviting consumers to act as shareholders in the brand, or product experience, uh, these consume communities and relationships can also really act as informative and insightful feedback channels for brands or retailers as they're developing those activations and products. So I think two things to keep in mind about Gen Z when developing your own community is that they're extremely connected to each other, to the world, to brands and retailers, and this has made them hyper aware so, you know, authenticity and transparency need to really be at the center of any community that you're building. And the second part is that because they're so connected, they're demonstrating a higher level of engagement and there is an expectation for control of their own experiences with brands or input into their favorite brands. And that's something that I think retailers should really be looking to harness. Um, Gen Z is acting as, you know, this architect of their own lives. And that includes, you know, products, services, and experiences define them that define them. So I think as they're building these communities or exploring communities, anyhow, any way that they're interacting with this Gen Z consumer, those are two things to maybe keep in mind. Let's build on that. Let's talk to Stanley Lumax. Stanley is CMO at uh, NRG Esports. Hey, Stanley, great to have you join us today. Thanks for having me. Great. Um, we were talking a little bit earlier about this stat from the PSFK server around survey around 50% of Gen Z uh, aspire to be an entrepreneur, they aspire to be a creator. Um, how do kind of brands and retailers uh, strive to support those goals? How do they kind of help uh, this generation achieve their aspirations? So I'm, I'm going to answer that in a very broad way because um, it's something that I, I think about and, you know, I'm brand new at my job. And as I've been thinking about how to speak to Gen Z and what the insights that I have that can help me speak to them in the most authentic way, something that keeps coming into my mind. And I think it speaks directly to what you're saying about entrepreneurism is this idea of Gen Z want to be seen and heard. And, you know, without getting into too many, you know, numbers, it's really simple when you look at the amount of social media platforms that they utilize um, and what they're doing with those platforms, right? So whether it be videos of themselves and their friends doing whatever, or, you know, something as ubiquitous as Twitter, where they're speaking and <clears throat> sharing their voice, um, to me, really simply, that says Gen Z wants to be seen and heard. So I think from when you think about it from the perspective of, you know, being entrepreneurs, um, the immediate thing that I think about is from a brand standpoint 
how do I create a platform to help Gen Z be seen and heard? Really simple. Um, and obviously, depending on what exactly they're looking to do, there's different ways to do that. But I think the days of dictating what Gen Z should be doing or what they want to do are over. Um, you know, content creators is the norm for this generation. So as, as brands and, you know, those individuals that have platforms, we should be thinking about how we can amplify their voices. That's great. So I can understand how maybe an eSport platform allows people to be part of that, whether as a fan or even a participant. When it comes to kind of maybe more lifestyle brands, classical legacy retailers, do you have any thoughts about kind of what the opportunities might be for them to kind of engage, transact, interact with, uh, with this audience? Um, I, I don't think it changes. I mean, I'll use an example as, you know, you know, Nike ID, right? Nike, Nike's been doing Nike ID for a long time and they've evolved it um, so that it's not just putting your initials on the shoe. You can actually choose the material and things of that nature. So that's a great example of how they're giving uh, Gen Z a voice. You know, Converse does the same thing. Um, you know, we're, I think we're at a point where you know, customization is just table stakes. Uh, customization, I think, is a, is a great way to engage people and, and make them uh, a part of the process, even if it's a small, um, you know, aspect of that that process. Um, yeah, I think personalization, customization comes up time and time again. And maybe it's also kind of connects to that theme of being seen and heard that you were talking about earlier on. Yeah. And, and I would also add to that, I think, um, amplification, right? So as an entrepreneur, when you're starting a business, whatever that business might be, you're looking to speak to as many people as possible, right? So if you're a small business and, you know, your network is your college, you know, friends and, you know, the people in your neighborhood, a brand, you know, amplifying your, your product, whether it be through a piece of content, a tweet, an Instagram post, all of those things help to give, you know, your, your brand a voice. So I think that goes back to my original point about, you know, helping uh, these Gen Z entrepreneurs being, being seen and heard. Super insightful. Let's turn to Michael Abata. Michael runs brand partnerships at Shutterfly. It's great to have you here, Michael. Thanks so much for having me, Pierce. So I'd love to talk to you about your takes on Gen Z. Uh, we did a survey recently and we found that 50% of Gen Z uh, aspire to be an entrepreneur or a creator. Um, if that's the case, how should brands and retailers respond to those goals? What sort of partnership should they forge? Yeah, I would really be thinking about how you embrace that desire to create you know, what tools and services and resources you and your brand or business can provide to really enable those entrepreneurs and that creator mindset. You know, I know many creators right now, I'm observing a lot of them who are hacking together solutions, sort of exploring ways um, that they can manipulate to create these amazing things. And there's a lot of friction points they're experiencing. And I think within those friction points, are a ton of opportunities for our brands to help really enable them to be successful. If you can show up as a brand with solutions that allow them to grow and sort of create and enable that entrepreneurship spirit, uh, I think you can be a really relevant brand right now. So let's talk a little bit about what those opportunities could be in terms of engaging this audience, transacting, interacting, building with them. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I've just been seeing, especially there's so many in our world uh, where we're, we're, we're talking a lot about personalization and custom and on design type items. Like I see a lot of the younger creators and entrepreneurs using tools for uh, using existing tools for other things. So for example, a lot of kids these days are on like Canva doing uh, creating products, uh, you know, using design and from other from other creators, um, and so it's like how, we've been thinking a lot about like how do we enable sort of that 
create that marketplace of designs and, and bring that to life? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, which we heard from other speakers about um, um, being able to be playful, go out there, try to get something, try to do it. Don't be too scared of getting things wrong. And I like your point here about um, kind of leveraging other people's platforms rather than trying to build everything yourself. Yeah, that's right. I also, I also have been really intrigued and interested in just seeing how brands are sort of playing into that creator and entrepreneurial uh, mindset. So I was just sharing the other day an example. Uh, the I don't know if you saw the McDonald's menu hack that they put out last month. I thought that was a really good kind of fun example that was playing into everyone sort of wanting to be a creator, right? And so you kind of had to learn about what those hacks were. You went to McDonald's and order your your two items that made this unique item and you could show that off. And so it was kind of, it's kind of fun to also see brands kind of leaning into just the, this idea that people have this desire to, to be unique and create things. So it doesn't always have to be a super sophisticated influencer program. It can be just something which kind of plays to yeah, curiosity. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Well, let's build on that. Let's turn back to Anthony Onesto and talk to him about uh, co-creation and collaboration. He was talking, you, Anthony, you were talking just a minute ago about um, kind of the new ways we can market and engage these consumers. And kind of one of the key elements is this sort of collaboration. I wonder whether you can expand on what the opportunity is there. Sure, absolutely. And, I, and again, I don't think it's too much far from where we've seen with millennials in terms, I think millennials introduced us to this idea of collaboration. For you and I, peers, and I'm assuming you're in that Gen X like me, or maybe a, a little bit less than that, maybe millennial, but advertisers have advertised towards us, right? We've watched, we've engulfed content, uh, and that was that changed our buying behaviors. This generation wants to be part of the story, right? So you see this happening. You see, uh, you saw it with the millennials in terms of the influencer piece. This generation wants to be involved in the conversation, and they have, you know. And it's not just about ego and it's, it's, it's about the gamification piece. It's about the attention piece piece, but it's also about purpose, right? The idea of uh, like how purposeful is your organization. And it's super important for this generation uh, in terms of climate control and, and, uh, and climate issues in the, in, in the world, right? Super important to this generation that brands focus on that stuff. So the idea is like, how do we create and co-collaborate in these things? Again, I think it has a lot to do with the gaming, right? You're in the game. You are a participant in the game. Now, of course, the content is all around you. And a lot of it is already pre-built by engineers and designers in that world. But you're in that world. You're creating your experiences. And to me, there's no better opportunity for, for brands to really focus on that gaming piece, right? How do we create environments? How can we bring the community in and allow them to create these digital environments where maybe you're not, you're not, you're not the the complete facilitator of it, you're allowing all these folks to put together these environments, put together these opportunities, but you're, you're, you're slapping your label on it or you're giving them the ability, you know, skins are a big deal now in gaming, right? You, you, and now we have virtual coins in gaming. So incredible opportunity. I, I really I can't overemphasize the importance of gaming in the, not, not only in the purely tactical sense of it, but really in the, the mindset shift in how Gen Z thinks. Great, to build on that, let's turn to Amanda. Uh, Amanda, do you have any other kind of comments around where and how businesses can interact and create opportunity with this generation? Yeah, absolutely. So look at another ripple effect of being so online throughout their entire lives is that today's teens are very connected to each other and very comfortable creating content over half of US kids are on roadblocks, two thirds of which are aged between nine and 11. This is a game where you can connect with others to play, but also program your own games. Similarly, among slightly older kids, we see content creation alongside content consumption on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. And then moving one step further on platforms like Depop, we see the blurring of lines between buyers and sellers, which brings commercialization into this blurry con consumption creation space. So the, look, the, the, 
the challenge is that that line between consumption creation and commercialization has been blurred. This can be really challenging for brands because essentially they have to be okay with losing control. Brands can't control their narrative in the way they used to be able to. But in, in terms of opportunity, businesses need to think about how they can enable user generated content, how they can empower consumers to create and share and how they can empower consumers even to earn through their products. Amazon currently has the drop where they work with influencers design to design and then sell limited edition fashion items. But what if we could take that to the next level from influencer collabs to everybody collabs? It's a really, really interesting and potentially untapped opportunity. Well, that's really interesting. I think all the insights that the experts have provided us uh, have been really helpful. I can see in the chat forum that uh, people have been responding to that conversation. So thank you for that debate. Maybe we'll turn one final time to Lauren Lyons, uh, the senior strategist who kind of created the Gen Z report. Um, Lauren, how do you reflect? What are your kind of key takeaways when it kind of comes to the conversation that we just had with those experts? Yeah, so I mean, so many great points. Um, I really wanted, I loved Stanley's insight and I really wanted to build around his idea about amplification and how brands can partner with these creator consumers. And I think it's going to be even more important for brands to be reflective of the values of Gen Z when they look to incorporate and partner with these creators. Um, to Amanda's earlier point as well, if a brand is only making, you know, greenwashing claims or inauthentic initiatives, Gen Z is going to be able to assess that behavior out. So if you're a creator that has amassed a trusted following, the brands you're going to be interested in working with will be a reflection of those shared values. So whatever they may be, and it's going to be brands and retailers that are delivering on those values that will win, so to speak, these talented partnerships. It's a nice final point and wrap up. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the experts who joined us. Thank you to Lauren Lyons and her PSFK IQ research team. Um, and thank you to everybody who turned up today, everybody who contributed to the chat forum and who everybody who kind of um, watched along. Uh, my name is Piers Forbes. I'm the founder of PSFK and PSFK IQ. I hope you uh, come to another one of our webinars. Uh, read our Rita Innovation Week newsletter or our PSFK newsletter. And um, I hope to see you soon. Thank you. The contents of this webinar have been inspired by studies conducted by the PSFK research team. Their reports are part of a collection of over 400 reports that share innovation strategies and brand CX in retail. And this library is updated weekly and can be found in the PSFK IQ Business Intelligence platform. Visit psfk.com to sign up for a free